Welcome to today's workshop on emerging technologies in education. Thank you for joining me. And I'm really pleased to be presenting with you today at the RTCon for 2020. I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see my presentation. So my name is Meredith Ebbs. I work for the University of Adelaide and I teach teachers how to use technology in the classroom. I also am a teacher. I work with stage two, years three and four in a school. I also teach technology one day a week. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which you are watching from. The land where we work, live and learn. And I'd like to recognise the continuing connection to the land, the water and the community. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to welcome any Indigenous people here today watching with us. Feel free to comment in the section of the land you are watching from. I'm on Birupai land, which is mid north coast. Today I'm going to be talking about emerging technologies. These are technologies which you may or may not have heard of and you may or may not have seen. So the first thing we need to do is just clarify some of the things that we are required to teach and why we have to teach them. I'm going to talk about cyber security and then I'm going to move on into the digital technologies, augmented and virtual reality and artificial intelligence. Right throughout the presentation, I'm going to be giving you some examples of how you can apply these technologies in your classroom. And at the end, I'll be giving you ways to learn more, uh, given that it is a mandatory content for your teaching. So I work for the University of Adelaide. I'm part of the CESA program. We've been running for about four and a half years. On our website, which is down in the left-hand corner, we have multiple online courses, we have professional learning, we have resources which you can access from home or from school. The first thing I'd like to address is why we need to teach these digital technologies. And it comes back to social justice. We need to ensure that every child has access to digital technologies and quality Wi-Fi that every child learns how to use a computer and is given the opportunity to create things with technology. It's not enough to expect that families will have the money and the resources to provide these experiences at home. The Australian curriculum started being implemented across Australia in 2014. And as of last year, every single state in Australia has either implemented the Australian curriculum or their local version of the Australian curriculum. And it's our responsibility as teachers to be familiar with that content so that we can assist all students in learning the, about digital technologies. Throughout the presentation, I'll be giving you some ideas on how to teach with digital technologies. I'll also be giving you some ideas to teach in an unplugged way. That means you can teach the concepts without having the latest and greatest shiny toy. This is an image that I've obtained from the Digital Technologies Hub website. It's a great resource for anyone looking for skills and activities to implement with digital technologies. The left-hand side is using ICT. ICT stands for Information and Communication Technology. It's quite an old term and we've had it for a long time. But this refers to your ability to use your phone your ability to use your laptop and connect devices together to print or to for email or social media. It's about logging on and managing files. It's about ownership of material and online content. The right hand side is about digital technologies and it's about the skills we need to create content and create solutions. Most commonly people hear teachers referring to coding and robotics as two things you need to create with digital technologies. But it is actually a lot more than that. It's actually about your thinking strategies, your algorithms, it's about your computational thinking, it's about pattern recognition. And there's a lot of components to go that go toward digital technologies and creating a solution. 
it's crucial that when we teach in schools that we address the right hand side for your mandatory digital technologies content. The left hand side using ICT is actually inside every single syllabus area from K to 12. And you need to be sure that as a teacher in whatever area you are, you are addressing the red side. It may be in your school that the green side is done by a classroom teacher, a faculty teacher, or a specialist. Any of those is fine. It is often perceived as a specialty area, but you don't need to be a specialist to actually introduce these concepts. You may have seen these circles before. They're from the Australian curriculum. The left-hand circle is a breakdown of the design and technologies and the digital technologies curriculum areas. Each of these curriculum areas is now implemented Australia-wide, either via the Australian curriculum or your local documents. The right-hand side is talking to the ICT capabilities, your information, communication and technologies. This document will be shared by the RTCon and you'll be able to access all of the links inside this document. I'll also put a link to this document in the comments on the day that this runs. So you can see there is a scope and sequence and a sequence of achievement for both digital technologies and for design and technologies. This is the sequence of content for digital technologies. This is the sequence for your design and technologies. You can see that it is quite extensive. If you work in a state which is, has their own local version of the Australian curriculum, these content descriptors, the numbers in brackets, would still be referenced inside your version of that, this document. The content descriptors are referred to by the number in brackets. If you are working in a state which does not use the Australian curriculum directly, but has its own local version, these content descriptors are still referred to inside your own, in your local copy of the documents. To find resources for your content, you can do searches on these numbers and you will find resources that link directly to your document via the content descriptor. Cybersecurity versus cyber safety. Now, cyber safety is something that we've talked about in schools for quite a while. In fact, I think I wrote my first cyber safety program for K-12 in about 2012. Mm -hmm. So it's been around for a long time. And resources you might use to teach cyber safety are included in this document at the end. Resources such as the eSafety Commissioner in Australia and Common Sense Media are really great resources for teachers to be able to access content so that you can teach children how to be safe online. Cybersecurity, however, is a little bit different. We haven't really taught cybersecurity in schools extensively, and there are movements to start doing this now. So, what is cybersecurity? What is cyber awareness? And what is the difference with cyber safety and the truth is they're all related. If you don't have good cyber security on your systems you will still be prone to being hacked regardless of how safe your password is. So this is a picture of the different layers inside the security of a system and the first one at the bottom is all about user behaviour. And an example of this is for your secretary or the person at the front desk of your workplace. If they walk away from their computer and leave their computer turned on and not locked, anybody can come behind the desk and access all of the systems that they have open on their computer. So it really is crucial that you lock your screen to your computer when you walk away from your desk. And this is, can be annoying in a classroom, but it does mean that it stops students particularly from accessing sensitive and private information. We also need to think about user behavior in terms of passwords. The most common password used by people is the word password. Another option is password 1234. It might be your child's name with the number after it. It might be your favorite food, your favorite location. These are all things that can be hacked 
if somebody knows you well enough. Another problem with user behaviour is the sharing of passwords. The fact that children allow others to actually have access to their password or a log, allow others to log on on their computer, that would mean they can access someone else's uh, content, whether it be Google Drive or Microsoft or their social media. You do need to be careful that if you're in a relationship and your partner knows your password and something happens that you change your passwords once something in the midst of all the disasters that might happen around that. Policies and procedures are the next important layer in a secure system. That would include staff training that goes along with how do you make your passwords, processes like making sure you lock your computer when you walk away from your desk, and or how you respond to suspicious emails. The training may even go so far as to help you identify suspicious emails. One click on the wrong link and you could bring down the entire network of your workplace. You then have things such as physical security. So these would include locking gates, ID cards, pin pads on your doors, swipe cards and secure rooms placing servers and important machinery inside a locked room. This way it stops people from just walking in, picking it up and taking it out. So physical security is still an important part of cybersecurity. You've got your network security. This is so that people can't tamper with wires, can't tamper with modems, can't hack your Wi-Fi. And network security goes even further these days on cybersecurity. And there was a speaker from a financial institution and they were talking about their network security. Now, what I took away from that was that they had two different networks set up for users and their customer data. And then they had a second network set up for devices that are on the internet, such as fridge, lights, kettle, robot vacuum cleaners, all those devices that are internet enabled are a potential doorway for a hacker to get into your Wi-Fi. By having two different networks, you'll actually avoid hackers being able to access your really sensitive data, which will potentially have a higher level of security. In schools, this might look like staff and students being on one Wi-Fi system and admin being on another Wi-Fi system or even admin being hard cabled and not on Wi-Fi. By doing that, the students can't access the admin systems. Teachers might have access to both and they may be able to switch between the two systems depending what they need to do. That actually happens at my school. So at my school, if I need to print, I go onto the admin system. If I'm working with the students, I put it on the EDU system. And that way the students have no access to our personal and private data of the students in the school, running of the school. However, I can still access their information that they save. That yellow level is your application security. This is about security of different applications and different tools that you might sign into. So for example, if I was to sign in to a new computer with my passwords, I might get sent a text message to say, someone is trying to access your system, please enter this code. And then I need to enter the code that's sent to my phone onto my login so that I can verify that the person logging in on the new computer is actually legitimate. Your last level of security is your encryption and your hashing of your data information and also backups. So encryption is where we, rather than store passwords as plain text, we might store them as asterisks or um, hash, hash signs. And then hashing is also when you enter your password, it doesn't actually type your real words that you're typing, it actually types a dot or a hash instead of your characters that you're typing. So if someone's looking over your shoulder, which is a perfect way to social hack someone, uh, and children are amazing at getting passwords a letter at a time. So really be aware of who's standing around you when you're entering your passwords. And then you've got your data backups. 
make sure that when you uh, work in a system that the data is being backed up. Now, in a large organisation like the Department of Education, there is people who are actually responsible for that. You don't need to worry about that. But if you work in a very small workplace, it's partly a discussion that may involve teachers on site, particularly if there's only two or three teachers working in a small space. You might discuss data backups and who's doing it and making sure that data is run. But if you've got precious information such as photos, your personal photos, where are you storing those in addition to your Google Cloud or your Apple Cloud? Where are you storing them in addition to having them just on your phone? Have you got a backup of those photos somewhere else? So let's have a little look at a, the layers of security as it might look in an international flight, something that we all wish we could do right now, I know. But it all starts with your passport. Now to apply for a passport, you have to have a birth certificate, a marriage certificate, a divorce certificate if you've actually changed your name, change of names, proof of identity. You might also need to have your Medicare card, all sorts of different things in order to actually apply for your passport. And if you uh, ha have difficulties with your identification documents and you do manage to get a passport, make sure they never expire because it's actually really difficult to get it if your identity is mixed up. And some people this happens because they're documents are from overseas and they're in a different language or you might be like me where someone at birth, death and marriage legally changed my name when I got married and I didn't know because they made a spelling mistake. So you have to be really careful about your identification documents and be really particular that they're always correct. Then you have your CCTV, you have your security staff. When you walk into the airport, someone's there, they're welcoming you, they're checking that you've got, you're logging in okay. And you've got, you have to show your authorised documents. If your name doesn't match the name on your passport, you won't be allowed to fly. There is an example last year where some, a journalist checked themselves in using the automatic kiosk onto a, a in a Sydney airport went and checked into the lounge for the travellers and when Sophie Monk and her partner turned up to check in, her partner couldn't check in because someone had already checked in in his name. So there was a little, a lot of fuss about how secure the kiosks are that are automatic. And I noticed after that, there was a change where you were given a lot more choices of where you were flying. But in the instance of a celebrity, people often know in advance where they're flying. So it's really important that you keep this type of information secret and don't publicize where you're going or when or what day so you need to keep some of that data secret facial recognition fingerprinting hand printing they are all starting to become more common in airports different countries have different rules you get scanned for physical threats don't carry anything more than the minimum amount of liquids on your body or you will have it removed you also have to have an identity check with your destination confirmed once you get to the gate. You get a valid boarding pass, you show the pass, the valid boarding pass is checked again when you get on the plane and then you get matched into an allocated seat. If you move seats, the stewardesses will get quite upset with you. So please sit in your allocated seat. This is information from the eSafety Commissioner. The eSafety Commissioner is the Australian person who's responsible for online safety in Australia. In terms of social justice, it isn't about whether you have a connection, it's about how fast your connection is. So do you have a quality connection and quality service? That is really what is most important. These links will be available to you when you download the document from the comments on the day, or from RTCon's uh, site. So Common Sense Media is an American website. It also has a really great digital citizenship program and I really highly recommend it. The Safety Commissioner has a great resource and a lot of great different programs for different ages. And as you can see, you can filter based on age and the topic. Hector's World is my favourite. It's a cartoon series with a whole lot of information and it's great for years catered to. And these printable worksheets 
and lesson plans that you can download for your program. I've used all of these books to teach digital safety to students. Some of them are more appropriate for different ages than others. Uh, the first two, Internet's Like a Puddle and Goldilocks, I would use those with an older age group. Uh, the Internet is Like a Puzzle might be a little bit scary for some little kids. The Fabulous Friend Machine is a great resource for uh, teaching small right through up to year six kids. It talks about how a chicken finds a phone and meets some new friends. And plot spoiler, the friends are wolves and the best friends, the real friends, actually come and save her. So a great range of books to use to teach safety. So what are digital technologies? Now what I've done here is put a range of technologies that you've probably seen in schools and if you haven't I would be asking why? Why don't you have at least one of these? Uh, so your Makey Makey and your Shake Ups, these basically do the same job. This is an Australian produced product. This is an American product. They essentially do the same thing. The Makey Makey probably has a little bit more functionality than the Shake Up. The Microbit is the cheapest product there and that would be really suitable from K right through to 10 because the platform for coding that device has um, blocks JavaScript and Python. So you can do your block coding K to six, and then you can move into your text coding in year seven to 10. The benefit of this microbit device is it's about $30. So you really want to buy the microbit go if you're going to buy these. They're really affordable, $30. And I've been using those with years three to six for a long time. The new version that's just about to come out, make sure you buy the newest version has a speaker and a microphone inbuilt into the board. But if you have the older models like I do, you will find that that has a compass, a thermometer, accelerometer, gyroscope, and you can also have buttons and tilt, tilt functionality as well. The blue board on the bottom right corner is an Arduino. And Arduinos are more used in high school. You can use blocks, but predominantly text coding. Now the important thing to do is when you're teaching your block coding is you would teach it, you're teaching concepts, not necessarily just how to build something. So in a primary school, very rarely would I introduce text-based coding to a primary school student. They need to fully understand all of the concepts that go with coding before they venture into text. And the only kids that I've ever used text coding with really is your gifteds. They're the ones who have really taken it up. So if you're in a high school, uh, microbits are ideal because you've got blocks, JavaScript and Python available to you. And that allows you to differentiate because kids who can't spell can't code. So by using blocks with kids who can't spell, what will happen is you still engage them in your classroom. You can get them to compose their code in the blocks and then swap to your JavaScript or your Python to actually check what they've done. Ask them to identify the line that says when button A is pressed. Print out the text coding and get them to look through and read it and find out what they're looking for. For example, what row does it tell us to flush the light? By doing that, you're actually still meeting your outcomes for years seven and eight, but you're actually um, differentiating your teaching to cater for those kids so they're still engaged. This is an example of some of the robots you may have seen in your schools. Uh, once again, the microbit robot would probably be my favourite. Not necessarily that model, but any microbit robot because you've got your microbits for about $30 and that McQueen robot there was about $70. Compared with your Spheros, which are about 180 each, and the same would be for your Mbot and your Dot and Dash, they're probably a couple of hundred dollars. And the Naos, they're just like thousands, so they're not even in the reach of most schools. If you don't have robotics and you don't have anything in your school, I would start with microbits purely because of cost. Now, this is more a high school content, but design and technology 
can be is now moving away from your traditional industrial arts and moving toward more computerized uh, engineering tools and so you've got your vacuum form tools your laser cutters and your 3d printers there are schools that have these in primary schools and really it comes down to having a passionate teacher who's prepared to assist with maintenance and fix um, fixing projects as they're printed. So I did promise that when we were talking about digital systems that we would have unplugged options. And these are just three books that I really love to use when I'm teaching digital systems. And just yesterday, I read Journey Inside the Computer to kindergarten and they loved it. They really loved it. And after that, we did a little activity where we had to identify hardware and software and what was digital and what wasn't. And that really would cover the learning outcomes for kindergarten. And it's also possible to teach coding with books as well. And these books will actually support you if you're teaching concepts. So don't be afraid to introduce unplugged concepts to teach your digital systems. And it might be that once you've done that, you might create a procedure in English in how to code a sandcastle. They have to write down the steps. And then maybe you would go and introduce some sort of robotic lesson where they have to code the B-bot to move around or code a little Ozobot to move around and in a certain order and they have to write that down. If I Were a Wizard was actually written by an Australian educator and I really like this book because at the back of the book, it has a uh, like a glossary of all the terms and each page is linked to a different concept that you would use in digital technologies. Uh, Paul has actually also got an app which integrates auto augmented reality and he has a website that goes with that. Uh, just be aware that there was a previous book called The Same Thing. It's blue with a black and black cover that's not the book you want. You really want to buy the one with the um, possum on the front, uh, even though it looks a little bit like a mouse. I think it's actually a possum. The Hello Ruby books and this blue book here is also in the same series. She has a website which has lots and lots of great activities for teaching concepts unplugged. And these would be great for casual teachers. You read your book and then you come back in and this is an activity to make a remote control and that would could easily be done in one lesson. You might need a little bit of time to read the book first and then, but you could do that in a reading activity. Uh, and then you have here making your own laptop. And what I tend to do with that one, these get printed on A4 pages. And what I tend to do with that is I stash up all my biscuit boxes and my cereal boxes and things like that. And then I also remind the children to bring their own box in and we stick that paper onto your cardboard. This page illustrates some of the emerging technologies that you may have seen in schools or homes. You've got virtual assistants that according to a chart earlier in this presentation, said 17% of homes have. However, many people have virtual assistants turned on on their devices. We have Siri, Alexa, and Hey Google. Self-driving cars are not quite here yet, but we do have examples of self-driving cars that are being piloted across Australia. We have a self-driving bus in Adelaide and Newcastle. We have a self-driving tram in Sydney or light rail in Sydney. And these are going to become more common. A lot of the cars that you buy new now have assisted driving on them. And that is when you go to make a severe turn that isn't expected, it, the car will try to correct you. Virtual reality is becoming far more common. We have devices such as Google Cardboard and headsets. You have robots such as iVac, the iRobot that vacuums your house. And we have drones and drones are probably the most common on that page. Be aware that if you're using drones, there are rules and regulations that govern drones for schools and for business and for hobbyists. And one of the things that you must do is keep a certain distance from people. You're not to fly over motorways and you need to store them 
in a, if they have a lithium battery, in a fireproof bag or box. These are some links for some unplugged computer science activities that you might like to explore. But what we're going to talk about now is we're going to talk about some virtual reality. What is it? Virtual reality is when you have a headset comes on your head and you are immersed in another world. It's usually 360 so that you can look around and up. You will be immersed in a world that is not reality. Virtual reality is being used in the real world for a variety of things. It's being used to train astronauts before they go to space. It's being trialed with Alzheimer's patients. And Google Earth has a virtual reality component also where you can virtually visit anywhere in the world. There's a variety of hardware that's required for virtual reality. And this top left picture shows some of the equipment that can be used. You don't need all of the equipment, but you will need a mix and match of some of that. So your headsets are the most expensive option, but they are fully inclusive. So you don't need to buy extra parts. You then have your Google Cardboard, which is probably the cheapest option, but you will need to have a phone that will slide in behind the Google Cardboard to act as the lens and the computer. These here are cameras and remotes. So the remotes can be used to activate things on the screen for the, the participant. The cameras can also be used to create 360 degree photos and footage to be used in a virtual reality situation. This black headset and wrist guards are used as in the image to the right, shows you that you can interact with your environment that you're visualizing. The thing to be aware with virtual reality is it can cause motion sickness because your head is fully enclosed inside an environment and there are limits on age. They do believe at the moment that children under 13 shouldn't use virtual reality because it can cause false memories. Uh, so you need to keep watch this space and see what the research is um, continually bringing up. But a great tool for high school. Google Cardboard can be used with younger children because as you can see in this image, they can take the headset off when they've had enough and it's not fully in immersing them in a world. This is an example where Google Expeditions is being used with a group of students. Each child has a Google Cardboard with a phone inside it and they're able to visit a location that the teacher can interact and direct so the students see specific things. Google Cardboard has been used with children under the age of 13 because it's not fully immersive and the children can actually remove the headset whenever they like. You don't tend to use this one for a long period of time. So if you are going to use virtual reality with younger children, a Google Cardboard style arrangement would be the best. Notice that Google Cardboard has got phones inserted. Augmented reality is when you have an image that superimposes over your real world. And an example would be Google Glasses, which didn't really take off. They're a little bit ahead of their time. Another example of augmented reality is Pokemon Go, which a lot of people have played and it still is active today. So you have your phone, you're looking through the camera of your phone and an image will superimpose over the top, whether it be a map or an arrow or whether it be a, an image of a cartoon character in the, in the world of Pokemon Go. You might also receive vibrations on your phone or feedback when you're actually moving through a particular space. So augmented reality is when you superimpose information on real world environment, such as Pokemon Go. If you haven't seen Pokemon Go and you haven't experienced running out of data because your kids are crazy on finding these little animated creatures in the world around you, you have truly missed out on a large data bill. So this is the first, I would say, truly embedded augmented reality experience for this generation. There was a game, it's still current, kids still play it and they've now launched new Pokemon. 
You've also got examples where your augmented reality for maps overlays over your experience. You've got filters in social media, namely Snapchat, if you've ever used Snapchat. And then you've also got retail experiences where people can position their phone in their room and see what furniture will look like in their room. Change the colour. You can do the same thing with painting and wallpaper. It provides a digital layer over the top of your camera. The AR also requires a trigger image. Now, mostly people who've been out for dinner in the last seven months will have experienced a QR code where you have a crazy little code where you scan it with your phone and it pops you into a website where you register. So you can use trigger images to trigger augmented reality, which may be video, it may be something similar to having this little picture pop up over the top of your, of your room. Now in education, we can use that for 3D simulations. So you could have it display scan a t-shirt and you'll actually see the whole entire digestive system and a beating heart. Or you might scan an image and up pops a, a virtual display of the solar system. These are all different uses for augmented reality. Now, a Merge Cube is a 3D QR code, and I just happen to have one here. They're not very big, they're not very expensive. And what you do is each side has a different image, and when you scan it, it displays a different component of the image that you trigger. So your Merge Cube is like a trigger QR code. So a Merge Cube, is actually a three-dimensional QR code. And I have one here to show you. It's quite soft. So you can see there that I can actually squeeze this. So you can see it's not like that large. It's actually about seven by seven by seven. It's got a silver raised painted surface and each side has a different image. Now, if I was to scan, say, my solar system using the app, and I turn the, the merge cube, it will turn the solar system. So each side of the merge cube is actually linked to your three dimensional image that you're displaying. You can, if you don't have the money to buy the three dimensional object, which I think they're about $30, you can actually print uh, this paper version uh, and what I did was I enlarged it. I happened to have a box and it happened to be a rectangular prism that had a lamp in it. So what I did was cut down the rectangle to be a cube. I enlarged my paper version to an A3 format and then I stuck it onto my box. So I now in my classroom have some quite large uh, merge cubes which we're planning to use this term. So you can see this is the solar system that I was talking about and the person's hand is actually holding the merge cube. And when they turn it, each side of the merge cube is linked to a different perspective in the solar system. To the left here, we've got some of the apps that you can use. And this one with the solar system is actually the app with the binoculars. So you can get those online. You just search Merge Cube. And these are some more apps that you can get using a different software platform called CoSpaces. I think you're allowed to have two experiences. I've actually got one that's called Metaverse. Now Metaverse is free. And uh, this is the link to the Metaverse app online. And this is a link to my experience. So um, I'm going to video it on my phone and it should come up. Uh, the other alternative, if I, if I click this link, it will open the online software. Go studio.gometa.io. You can download the app to your phone using these two links. If I go to my experiences and scroll down, here are my experiences that I've been experimenting with. If I'm to scan that code, it will take me to my phone and you'll see it. If I edit 
you can see how it is constructed. It's actually constructed by using one page per screen. So this would be my starting screen. And when I click one of those buttons, it will take me to the next screen. So you do need to plan your construction. And I do have a webinar that I'll add into the links that shows you how to plan this type of experience. Now, if I go and test this, I once again will get my QR code. Here are some examples of augmented reality. So you can see the shirt is triggering an image on the iPad for um, a 3D modeling of the inside of the human body. The picture in the middle has got a drawing that has been super, superimposed on a photo. And the last one where the person is scanning some cards is a triggered image to display three dimensional pictures of the planets. Mixed reality is when we combine virtual reality and augmented reality and it can include apps or sound, it can include immersion or it might include uh, overlay with sound and, and vibrations. Extended reality is when you start to import, implement artificial intelligence and include your virtual reality, your augmented reality and your mixed reality. So that brings us to what is artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is when we teach a computer how to think and make decisions based on the input. So it takes raw images, raw sound, raw text and processes it to turn it into something. And we've actually, another, another term for that is machine learning. And we've actually been teaching computers for a very long time. So whenever you enter your password in a website and you get a pop-up window that says, please click on all the pedestrian crossings, or please click on all the mountains or all the traffic lights, all the buses, that is machine learning. And we've been teaching computers what those things look like for a very long time. So when it has that information, it thinks it compares uh, pedestrian crossings to all the examples of pedestrian crossings. And the only way a machine can learn that is from lots of input, which is why it's been put onto users like us to actually teach the computers through clicking. We've got some examples of augmented reality for the classroom. We've got the human body. We've got in the center there an artifact that somebody has made. So you could have students making their own shapes to describe their own stories and experiences. And over on the right, we've got a space one that's being triggered by those cards. Mixed reality is a combination of both virtual reality and augmented reality. And mixed reality can include apps that provide augmented digital information with the option for users to go deeper with 360 experiences. So augmented reality and virtual reality are different, but when they come together, they're called mixed reality. Extended reality is when we start to implement artificial intelligence as well. These are some examples of AR in the workplace. I'm not going to go through these now today, but they're there for you to have a look at later. The link will be in the presentation notes. This is a great example of artificial intelligence. 
This app is a fundraiser for a Freddie Mercury Foundation and it's been created by Google. And so Google wants the information so they can start to create um, software that will recognize songs when you hum them or sing them. It's probably collecting the data and keeping it so that they can track people's voices and compare information to the original recording. So that's my recording. I'm quite proud of that. 78%. But if you want to have a go at singing some of the Queen's songs, there's an option there to listen to the song before you sing it. And some of them are easier than others. It depends how well you know the song. It uses II to voice match you with Freddie Mercury. So how much does your voice sound like to Freddie's? Are you in tune? And can you follow the melody? Now, if you'd like to learn more about our online courses or any of the information that I've talked about today, you can do that in any one of our online courses. They are all free. They have the eight soul standards mapped to the, each of the courses. You can see the foundations, extended next steps and explore. They are all digital technologies courses. Then you have teaching AI, which has a primary and a secondary option. And then you have cybersecurity and awareness, which has a primary and a secondary option. All of them have activity ideas in them, some unplugged, some with technology. Really useful courses. I highly recommend them. As of October 2020, the free lending library that the CSER team operate has no funding as of December. But if you feel this is a valuable service, could you please write to your local minister or to the education minister to express the need for this service? Should the lending library not proceed, that option there, that tile, has various lesson plans in there for all of the different equipment and you can use those, they are free. The resources section has a whole stack of resources that have been developed this year for online learning but are still relevant for classroom use. They can be used by teachers, parents or students. They are designed to be standalone and self-guided. These are the links to some of the resources that I've talked about during this presentation. If you'd like to connect with the CESA group, this is our, all of our social media. Thank you very much for staying with me throughout this session. And should you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them either in the comments of this uh, conference or you can connect with me on social media if you've missed some of the resources. Thank you very much.